chemical nomenclature. Nomenclature is a collection of rules for naming things. So, so far when we've been looking at chemical compounds, we've been looking and identifying them based on their chemical formula. So H2O or NaCl. Um, but we've mentioned their names a couple of times too, sodium chloride, um, for example. So there are a set of rules that we can learn so that when we see a formula like NaCl, which is made of a sodium atom and a chlorine atom, then we know that the name of that compound when they come together would be sodium chloride. So uh, in this section we'll learn the rules of naming different compounds. So we will name ionic and molecular binary compounds. So some of the two element compounds we look at will be ionic, meaning that it contains a metal and a nonmetal, and some of the two element compounds we look at will be molecular or covalent, meaning that they contain um, two nonmetal atoms. So we'll also um, look at the rules for naming ionic compounds containing polyatomic ions and um, the rules for naming acids. So first we'll name binary ionic compounds. So a binary ionic compound has two elements. That's what binary means. So when we see a chemical formula that has two elements, the first thing that we have to the first question we have to answer is whether it's an ionic compound or a molecular compound, a covalent compound. So the way that we figure that out is by determining if the elements that are in the formula are a metal and a nonmetal or if the elements in the formula are two nonmetals, which would make that a covalent compound. So it's important to make that distinction before we try to name it because we name ionic binary compounds and covalent binary compounds using a different set of rules. So if we've identified the compound as an ionic compound because it has a metal in it, then the way that we name it is by naming the first element first and we name the second element second obviously. So the first element in an ionic compound is always a metal. It's always the cation. So we'll name the cation first and then we'll name the anion second and the name of the cation is easy because it's just the same as the name of the element. So if it's a sodium atom at the beginning of the formula then the name of the cation is sodium. If it's a magnesium ion at the front of the formula then the name of the cation is magnesium. So to, to name the cation we just look to the periodic table because the name of that atom, the cation and the atom have the same name. But to name the anion, we have to do something a little bit different. We have to use the base name of the element, uh, which, which is um, usually the first several letters of an element, but it changes for different elements. There's some unique cases, and we'll look at some of those. But we take the base name of an element, and then we drop the ending of the element, and we add IDE to it. So, for example, if we have chlorine and we're trying to name this as an anion, then I would cross out the INE ending. and write chloride. So cl the, at the element chlorine becomes the anion chloride. So we drop the INE ending and we add the IDE ending. So for oxygen We drop the Y-G-E-N and we add I-D-E. So chlorine becomes chloride, 
oxygen becomes oxide. So the different elements, we can't just make a rule and say we drop the I-N-E from every element because not every element has an I-N-E ending. So we kind of have to look at each element and, and um, determine what the base name of that element is. And they're not, uh, there is no rule to, to, to name a base name. So let's, let's look at another one here that's a little bit different. Sulfur. For sulfur, all we drop is the UR, but we still add IDE so it becomes sulfide. Phosphorus becomes phosphide. So some of these are not intuitive, and you'll have to look some of them up on a table, um, because depending on the element, it's uh, it's difficult sometimes to know which letters are going to be dropped. Is it supposed to be uh, phosphide or phosphoride? It's, it's kind of hard to know how many letters you drop and how many letters you keep. So this is the basic idea when you're um, turning an, an anion into, uh, or turning an element into an anion. Drop the ending and you'll add IDE. So, an element with sodium and chlorine becomes sodium chloride. An element with sodium and oxygen becomes sodium oxide. And notice here that it doesn't matter that I have one sodium atom or two sodium atoms. I just say sodium chloride, sodium oxide. It doesn't matter that there's one and two. It's not in the, the name of the compound does not have numbers in it. Potassium bromide, one potassium, one bromine atom. Cadmium and sulfur makes cadmium sulfide. So when we're naming compounds that have polyatomic ions, remember a polyatomic ion is a group of atoms that stick together. So when I'm looking at a formula, and I'm trying to determine whether or not it has a polyatomic ion, at this point we can just um, count the number of elements. If we look at the ones we were just naming, all of these compounds have two elements. But if we look at these, element, these compounds that have polyatomic ions, this first one, potassium acetate, has four elements. Ammonium chloride has three elements. Sodium bicarbonate has four elements. Cassium sulfate has three elements. So if a compound has more than two elements, then it must not be a binary compound. And we just learned the rules for naming binary ionic compounds. Well, these must not fit that set of rules because these are not binary. They don't have just two atoms. They have, two, they have more than two different kinds of elements. So. In, the, in a binary compound, I have to name each atom. So I would call it sodium chloride or sodium oxide. So then if I were to apply that set of rules here, it seems like I would have to call this first one, oops, it seems like I'd have to call this first one potassium carbide hydride oxide. And I would have to name each individual element. But that's not, those are not the rules for naming um, compounds that have polyatomic ions. If we see a, more than two elements, then I don't name every single element. This group of elements, this right here, if we can identify the polyatomic ion, this group of atoms sticks together. It's a polyatomic ion. This group of atoms sticks together. It's a polyatomic ion. This group of atoms sticks together. This, oops, supposed to contain the sulfur.
this group sticks together, this group sticks together, and this group sticks together. So these are the polyatomic ions in each of these compounds. And if we can identify the polyatomic ion, then we can look on a table and give it a name. This uh, formula, this polyatomic ion, is called acetate. And we could match that to an entry on a table and see that, oh, C2H3O2 is called acetate. NH4 is called ammonium. HCO3 is called bicarbonate. So the, this group of atoms has one name. This is not called carbide hydride oxide. It's called acetate. It's not called nitrogen hydride. It's called ammonium. It's not called hydrogen carbide oxide. It's called bicarbonate. So these groups of atoms all have their own names, and they're names that you have to look on a table. You, can, um, you might see them often enough that you memorize some of them, but some of them you probably won't memorize. So just have a table of polyatomic ions nearby. So if you have to name something, you can look at the table. And another useful, um, another useful part of the table, another be a good way to use it, is that the tables of polyatomic ions usually contain the charges of the ions. And um, sometimes, even if we know that SO4 is called sulfate, sometimes we can't remember that it has a 2 minus charge. So the table is helpful to give you the name of the ion and its charge. So, if we've identified that there's a polyatomic ion, and we're going to uh, name the polyatomic ion, um, and we've looked it up on a table, then all we have to do is name the other piece. So here in this first example, I have uh, the polyatomic, which is called acetate, and I have this atom, which is called potassium. So I would call this potassium acetate. In this compound, I've identified this as the um, polyatomic ion. And that one, if I look it up on a table, it has the name ammonium. And so then I would look at the other atom, which is a chlorine atom. But since it comes last, it must be an anion. So it's not chlorine, it's chloride. So here's my polyatomic here. The other piece is called sodium. Sodium bicarbonate. Here's my polyatomic. I look it up on a table. It's called sulfate. Calcium sulfate. Aluminum carbonate. Magnesium phosphate. So we looked at how to name binary ionic compounds um, and polyatomic compounds where the cation, the metal that's in the compound, is a main group metal. So um, it, not a transition metal in that case. So remember the transition metals kind of come from the middle part of the periodic table there. Uh, rows number uh, 3 to 13. and most of the transition metals don't have just one charge. So whereas we could look at a sodium atom and a sodium cation and call them both sodium, I can't look at a transition metal's ion and it's doesn't have, they, it doesn't have the same name as the element itself because there's more than one. For example, I have, oh, let me go back. Chromium, chromium 3 plus chromium 4 plus chromium 6 plus. So a chromium is an, chromium is an element. It's a transition metal. And chromium has more than one cation. It can have different charges when it becomes a cation. So I can't call all of these things chromium because that would be confusing. So um, when I have more than one cation that an element can form, I have to give it an additional name. So chromium with the 3 plus charge, when I'm writing it out, I call it chromium 3. Oops. 
chromium 3. The 3 is in Roman numerals. So maybe you've forgotten your Roman numerals, or maybe you just never knew them. So Roman numerals go 1, 2, 3, 4, IV is 4, V is 5, VI is 6, 7, 8. So you're not going to need any more than that because we can't get any higher than uh, usually a 7, actually. Um, I don't, well, maybe there's, a, maybe there's a plus 8 oxidation state. So generally, it's not going to get higher than that. So um, know the first eight Roman numerals so that when you see a charge, I can say, oh, this is chromium 6VI. Put these numbers down here. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This one here is chromium IV. Four, chromium three. So here's some uh, examples of some other cations, iron 2, iron 3, cobalt 2, cobalt 3. So we just name the, um, the, the name of the cation is just the name of the element and its charge, the number of its charge, copper 1, copper 2. But when we write it, we have to write it in Roman numerals. It's not copper and then the number 1, it's copper and then 1 in Roman numerals. So when we're naming these things, if I were to see a compound over here, the first step would be, okay, this has two elements in it. Is this compound ionic or covalent? How can I tell? Well, the first element is a metal. Iron is a metal. And so if there's a metal in the compound, then it must be an ionic compound. So if it's an ionic compound, then I have to ask another question. Now I know it's ionic. Is this a main group metal or is this a transition metal? And in this case, iron is a transition metal. It comes from those inner rows of the periodic table. So if, a if it's a transition metal, then we have to give it a name that also reflects its charge. Iron, we know that in this compound I have FeCl3, which means I have one iron atom and three chloride anions. So how do I know that that's an iron 3? How do I know that the charge on that iron is 3 plus? Well, I have F, E, question mark. And then I have 3 chlorine. And remember, if we, we can look on the periodic table and see that chlorine is um, a halogen, and halogens all have a negative 1 charge. So just because of its position on the periodic table, I know that chlorine is minus 1. So if I have a total charge of minus 3, and I know that my compound has to be neutral, it can't have a charge of all, at all, then what number do I have to add to minus 3 to make 0? Well, it must be plus 3. 3 plus and 3 minus make 0. So the charge on iron is 3 plus. And I know that because I can see the charges on the chloride. And the charges on the chloride give me an indication that the charge on the iron must match those charges to cancel out, to become neutral. So here's another way that we can do this. Here's mercury and oxygen. So if we remember if we do mercury and oxygen we can do this the trick to to um, turn ions into a formula so let me let's remind ourselves what that looks like if i have iron 3 plus 
and um, Cl minus 1. And I want to know what does the compound look like when iron and chlorine make a compound? How many irons and how many chlorines? Well, I can do this trick. I called it the switcheroo earlier. Um, and remember what that is, is where the charge on the cation becomes the subscript of the anion, and the charge of the anion becomes the subscript of the cation. So that would make this one turn into Fe1Cl3, FeCl3. Well, that's the compound that I was trying to generate, FeCl3. So I know that that iron must be an, a 3 plus charge. So we can do that same thing here with mercury and oxygen, except we're going to call this the reverse switcheroo. How do I know what ions make this up? Well, if I break these apart, then I can, if I can turn charges into subscripts, then I can turn subscripts into charges. 2 minus 1 plus. My pluses aren't very good, sorry. 1 plus. So I can use the switcheroo to turn the ions into a formula, or the reverse switcheroo here to turn those subscripts back into the charge on the ion. So I know what ions made that up. So once I know that I have an ionic compound, and I know that it's a transition metal, I know that I have to name the metal um, and the charge, tin 2, tin 4, mercury 1, mercury 2, and so on. Okay, if I look at my compound and I determine that those two elements are not ionic, um, not, it's not an ionic compound. So for example, I have H2O or CO2. Both of these elements are nonmetals. Hydrogen is a nonmetal and oxygen is a nonmetal. Carbon is a nonmetal and oxygen is a nonmetal. So if both elements in a compound are nonmetals, then it's not ionic. It must be covalent in this case. So if it's a covalent compound, I have to use a different set of rules to name it. I can't use the same ionic rules to name it. The way that I have to name um, molecular or covalent compounds is by naming the first element and then naming the second element, just like we do when we name ionic compounds, except they have slightly different names. Um, we have to give a prefix to the first element if there's more than one of the atom in that compound. So um, when I make an ionic compound, there's only one formula that I can make from the combination of those ions. One aluminum 3 plus and chloride, chloride 1 minus, they always have to come together in a 1 to 3 ratio because there's a 3 plus charge on aluminum and a minus 1 charge on chloride. So they always have that ratio. There's only one compound aluminum and chloride can make, AlCl3. But there's lots of compounds that can be made by the same atoms that are nonmetals. Um, I can make uh, NO or N2O or NO, N2O5 or N4O. There's, there's lots of different... Um, combinations of atoms of compounds I can make with a nitrogen and an oxygen atom because they're both nonmetals. So I can't just use the same rules and call it nitrogen oxide because which one of these compounds is nitrogen oxide? This one, or this one, or this one, or this one? They're I can't just use the, the word, the term nitrogen oxide to name those. There's too many different compounds. So I use a prefix to, to tell me the number of each atom. Um, and then I'm going to name the second atom as if it were an anion. So let's look at some examples. Here are the prefixes. Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nana, and deca. Uh, 
um, for these numbers, if, if these are the subscripts in the formula, and here's some covalent compounds in their names. Sulfur, there's one sulfur, and there's two oxygen. So sulfur dioxide. We might think it's monosulfur dioxide. One sulfur, monosulfur dioxide, two oxygens. But um, often the mono is dropped from the beginning of um, a compound. If there's only one atom at the beginning of a compound, we usually don't call it mono. It wouldn't be monosulfur or monoboron. We'll drop that, that first mono from the first atom. The second compound would be boron trichloride. There's one boron and three chlorines, trichloride. Then sulfur trioxide sulfur hexafluoride. So this is tricky when we're naming these compounds because you might see something like this AlCl3 NCl3 Cl3 So if we have these three, if we have these four different compounds that are all made with three chlorines, then it's tempting to name them all using the same rules. Call this first one aluminum trichloride, nitrogen trichloride, boron trichloride, gallium trichloride. But it's only these, that would only be right for these two. This is nitrogen trichloride, and this is boron trichloride. That's right. This first one is not aluminum trichloride. The reason is because this is ionic. And remember, the first, our first step is to determine if it's um, ionic or covalent. This is a metal. This is a metal. These other um, nitrogen and boron, these are non-metals. Non-metal. So we use the mono, di, tri, tetra prefix when these are nonmetals. So nitrogen trichloride, boron trichloride. We don't call it aluminum trichloride. This is just called aluminum chloride. Ionic compounds have a different set of rules. I don't care how many chlorines there are. This is aluminum chloride because it's ionic. But this is nitrogen trichloride because this is covalent and it has a nonmetal. So sometimes we do put a prefix in front of the first element, dinitrogen tetroxide, tetraphosphorus decaoxide. So Sometimes when there's two, ele two, uh, two vowels together, the first vowel is dropped. So I think this one should be dropped. Deca oxide, I don't think that's right. I think it should be deca oxide. Because generally when two vowels are stuck together like this in the system, the first vowel is dropped. So um, with the exception of I. So dioxide, that, the I there isn't dropped. But at this one, this would be dinitrogen tetraoxide. We don't say tetraoxide, we say tetroxide. We drop that A from tetra if it would put two vowels next to each other. Okay, let's name some acids now. So, um, when we, when we look through a list of compounds, this is what, how, what we might be asked when we're trying to do naming problems. We might have a list of compounds like this. 
So if I'm trying to name all of these compounds, the first thing is to place them into a category because depending on what category they're in, I'm going to use different rules. So let's look for um, the ionic compounds first. This and this are ionic. I know that because they have a metal in the front. Potassium and sodium are both metals. So now I would put this one and this one in a different category because these are both covalent because that nitrogen and the carbon are nonmetals. Finally, I would put these two in, a, in another category because these start with hydrogen. Anytime a compound starts with hydrogen, it's actually an acid. So if we can identify a compound as an acid because we see that it starts with H, HBr, H2SO4, even, for example, H2O. Water is called H2O, and we put the H first because it's a weak acid. So any compound that starts with H is an acid. If we've identified that a compound is an acid, then we have to use a different set of rules to name it. So the first, um, when we have binary acids, they are named very similar, very similarly to um, uh, ionic compounds. So if we had um, an H and an F, and this were ionic, I would call it hydrogen fluoride. But when it's an acid, then the uh, I drop the GEN, and the two, the hydrogen and the fluorine come together, and it's called hydrofluoric acid. So I add IC acid to the end. So HF becomes hydro, hydrofluoric acid. HCl becomes hydrochloric acid. HBr is hydrobromic acid. Hydroiodic acid and hydrosulfuric acid. So when there are two elements in um, an acid, if I, if I know it's an acid because it starts with H, and it only has two elements, then I always put hydro first, and then I name the second element and add IC acid. Hydrofluoric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid. Sometimes um, there are uh, polyatomic ions in acids, like um, a sulfate ion. H2SO4, the SO4 is a sulfate ion, or H2CO3, the CO3 is a carbonate ion. If we ever have, um, if we ever have polyatomic ions in an acid, then the way to name those acids is a little bit different than a binary acid. Th in these, I don't name the hydrogen, so I have uh, H2SO4, it's going to be named based on the polyatomic ion, which in this case is sulfate. SO4 is a sulfate ion, so that's what I'll use to name this acid. And I'll drop the AT ending and add IC acid. So this would uh, be sulfate as the polyatomic ion becomes sulfuric acid. Down here, carbonate, as the polyatomic ion, becomes carbonic acid. Phosphate would become phosphoric acid. So we don't put hydro in the front. When it has a polyatomic ion, there is no hydro in the front. Sulfuric, carbonic, phosphoric. And we name the acid based on the name of the polyatomic. This is called phosphate. So phosphate becomes phosphoric acid. Carbonate becomes carbonic acid. Sulfate becomes sulfuric acid. So we have H2S and H2SO4. These are definitely confusing. And we have uh, HCl and H, oops, CLO. So these are very similar acids. 
and they have similar names but they have different names so this one is called hydro sulfuric acid this one is just called sulfuric acid this is called hydrochloric acid this is called hypochlorous acid so um, identifying a polyatomic ion in the acid is a, a very important step when trying to name it if it just has two elements then I just call it hydro something if it has more than two elements then I have to identify the polyatomic and name it after that so polyatomics that have an ATE ending are replaced with IC acid so sulfate sulfuric acid carbonate carbonic acid phosphate phosphoric acid if if um, a polyatomic ion has an ITE ending like nitrite or sulfite or chlorite then we add an OUS so hypochlorite becomes hypochlorous acid nitrite becomes nitrous acid sulfite becomes sulfurous acid so n identifying the polyatomic is the most important step to naming oxy acids because we name the oxy acid based on the name of that polyatomic anion oops so here are some of those um, some anion names acetate becomes acetic acid and here we can um, the polyatomic oops, in each case is just the part that's not hydrogen so all of these are the polyatomic ions so that's acetate it becomes acetic acid when it has an H in front nitrate becomes nitric acid when it has an H in front nitrite becomes nitrous acid perchlorate is ClO4- minus becomes perchloric acid carbonate CO3 becomes carbonic acid sulfate sulfuric acid so identify the polyatomic find its name and then change its name according to the rules of naming acids.